Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I am Brian Pinckney, and I always like to say that to make sure you know that I am Brian Pinckney and not Jerry Pinckney. <laughs> so, um, and it's confusing in my family because there's Jerry Pinckney, the dad, and there's also my mother, Gloria Jean Pinckney, who is also an author. They had a son, Brian Pinckney, that's me, <laughs> who's an author and an illustrator. And I've married an author, Andrea Davis Pinckney. Um, today, what we'd like to talk about is how we feel about the Common Core, but it's more so in relationship to how we create. And that in our process of creating, we're always on an inquiry, like an intellectual inquiry. And I, I kind of talked to Andre today about five different aspects of that inquiry. There's that creative inquiry in terms of the visual arts. There is the nonfiction inquiry into history and, and understanding how to communicate that to children. There is the inquiry into poetry. There's the poetry of the visuals and the poetry in Andrea's text. There's also an inquiry into music, which our books are very musical. And um, we feel that's a very instructive way of talking to children and getting them involved in our books. And then there's our collaborative inquiry, the fact that the two of us actually are always figuring out how do we collaborate together. And I, I think of teachers in that way because I think while you're teaching, you're always collaborating with your students and finding out what is the best way to, to kind of get them to create. And that's kind of like a collaborative process. So today, Andre's going to start out by talking about her background and a little bit about her process. I'll talk about my process. And then we'll kind of go back and forth collaborating in our presentation. OK. Well, thank you, Brian. So good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. And I am so happy to be at Teacher Appreciation Week. And yes, and as Suzanne mentioned, my mom was a teacher. And I appreciate my mom, and I appreciate you. So thank you for being here this afternoon. And actually, I'm going to start with a song. And if you work with young people, you probably know this one. And uh, if you don't know it, I'm guessing that you will probably catch on. OK? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Here at Teacher Appreciation Week, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Very good. You caught on. Give yourselves a round of applause. Now, um, the reason I, I like to start with that song is that I really believe that each and every one of us in this room has a very special light. And I know that you know that that's true of your students. So I'm going to ask you to help me with a little exercise. I'd like everybody to put your feet on the floor, if you will. If we were sitting on the floor, we could sit crisscross applesauce. But we won't. We'll just sit in our seats and put our feet on the floor. And then I'm going to ask you to uh, maybe put your hands in your laps and get very quiet for a moment. And now I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. This will not work if there are any open eyes. So this has to be done by all teachers and school librarians and scholastic friends and colleagues, tech people, all eyes closed. And I'd like you to think about that very bright light that we sang about today. And maybe it looks like a candle or a flashlight, but it's very bright. And now let's all shine that light on something in your mind that makes you very happy when you think about it. Something that brings you complete joy when you Maybe it's a place you like to go. Or your friend, or a puppy, or your pillow. OK, so you can open your eyes, come back into the auditorium. I saw a lot of concentration. Would you like to tell us the happy thing that was in your mind? Books. Books! <laughs> Books make me happy. You, you must be thinking of books now. You're smiling now. 
That's a happy thing. I see another smiling face. Happiness, joy, what was it? Harry Potter. Harry Potter. <laughs> what a great answer to be in the home of Harry Potter, feeling happy about Harry Potter. Okay, I would like to get a male perspective. Let's get a male perspective. Sir, what was the happy thing? Can you share it with us? I was thinking um, sitting in, in, in the patio outdoors, just enjoying the summer. Now that's my kind of happiness right there. <laughs> sitting on the patio, enjoying summer. There you go. I need to do that. I need to sit on the patio and enjoy summer. Um, thank you for helping me with that. The reason I like to do that, actually, I do this with students, and I find that it really works well, just calming the young ones down before we kind of get down to work. Um, I do this exercise every morning. I'm an early riser. I get up at 4 a.m. Yes, I do. And I have a very firm chair, and I sit in it, and I have my cell phone, and I put the cell phone on my knee because it has a timer on it, so I know how long I've been sitting there. And I do this for half an hour. I sit very quietly and think of happy thoughts like my patio and Harry Potter and books and all kinds of things that make me happy. And then I immediately go to my notebooks. These are my notebooks. If you see me, you will see my notebooks. They do not leave, I do not leave home without my notebooks. Now I have a question. Does that look neat to you? Um, no. No, thank you for being honest. <laughs> No, that does not look neat because, again, now it's about 5.30 in the morning and I'm just scrawling. I'm just writing anything that comes to mind. And then, after I've done my writing, it's a discipline. I do it every day. After I've done that, I immediately put on my bathing suit and I rush out of my house in Brooklyn, New York, where I live, and I go to the YMCA. I usually have my baseball cap pulled down low and it's now, like I said, about 5.30. And I'm knocking on the door, begging Beverly, the lifeguard, to let me in because I have to hurry up, go swimming, get back to the house so I can tend to my children and make sure they have permission slips, lunch boxes, reports, poems, student council stuff, science things, everything they need for the day. So I'm in a very big rush. Always have the notebook with me, um, which is why these pages are a little wet. And uh, you can see they're kind of warped there because you know how people have floaty things and kickboards at the edge of the pool? This is mine. I have my notebook. Usually my pen is stuck in the side. And there I am feeling happy, thinking good thoughts, doing backstroke, whatever. And uh, if I get an idea, I write it down. Now, one day I was doing that and I reached up out of the water with my idea in my brain, felt my pen, but realized I had left my notebook at home. Oh my gosh, I was in a panic. Now, I have to have the notebook with me. I have to write the ideas down immediately when they come to my mind. So if you were me in a desperate state, what would you have done? I've got a pen, I don't have a notebook. Hand, okay. You guys write on your hands. All right, no, good idea, and I've done that, but I was gonna go back in the pool, chlorine, shower, all that, so what else? You write on towels? <laughs> Now, I could have done that, but I have to say, the towels are the property of the YMCA. <laughs> and I will tell you another secret. I don't have a great relationship with Beverly the lifeguard <laughs> anyway, so, because she's blowing the whistle, time to get out, and then if I had written on the towel, all over. Would have been bad. Um, what else? Paper one or piece of paper? Piece of paper, piece of paper. All right, well, there's no paper in a pool. I mean, paper. Lifeguards would probably have paper. The lifeguards would probably have Beverly, me and Beverly. <laughs> Not gonna. Let me tell you what I did. I was, again, I was really feeling desperate. <laughs> now, I show this because there's something known as the myth of genius. And the myth of genius is that you have to be a genius to be a writer. That is not true. And I love to tell that to school children. That's the myth of genius. All you need is your hand or the towel, hopefully you have a good relationship with the lifeguard, a piece of paper, a notebook, whatever, get it down, the flip-flop, get it down. And here actually um, is the beginning of a book that became a book called Seven Candles for Kwanzaa. So if you see that book, think of the flip-flop. <laughs> genius, okay. So this is me, <laughs> when I was about 15 years old. Um, I loved kung fu movies, and I think I also wanted to be part of the Jackson Five. 
That's why I'm dressed like that. Um, I can remember painting this. I can remember having a little studio in my house and my parents that, you know, my father was an artist. He knew I was very creative and needed my own space. So my mother actually created a studio for me in our, in our house. And it was actually a closet. But, but it was a walk-in closet. And I was a really tiny kid, so it was perfect for me. And my father would give me all his old paints and paper. And um, I would do all my artwork on those things. And I can remember painting this again. It's done in um, something called Luma dyes, which is a type of really bright watercolor that my father was working in at the time. And I can remember learning how to paint that by watching my dad. Because my dad would love for me to come home from school and talk about my day at school. And he would always still be drawing at the table while I was talking to him. So I would talk about my homework or my soccer game. And I would usually talk about how badly we lost. <laughs> because my soccer team actually lost every game. But I don't want to talk about that. Um, <laughs> but while he was cheering me up, he would continue painting and kind of explain what he was doing. Um, and I remember, so when I was painting these bell bottoms, he would say, you know, what you do is first wet the paper with water, just where you want the color to go. But before that dries, go over with light blue paint. And before that dries, go over with darker blue paint. I remember saying, but dad, that's going to make a mess. He said, no, he calls that a happy accident. Because then I would turn all those swirls into the wrinkles. And you know, that's an important thing that I like to share with children when I talk about artwork, that is a lot of it is happy accidents. It's about playing. Um, it's about playing the way a basketball player plays, or about the way a musician plays. That the way to learn something and to get mastery is to be willing to make mistakes and hope you have those happy accidents and then learn how to turn those into success. Another thing I would do with my father is I would model for him a lot. So if my father was illustrating a story about a little boy from Africa, he would dress me up like I lived in Africa. Read me the story. I'd have to act out the little adventure. He would take pictures of me with his camera and do his sketches from those pictures. If he was doing a book about a little boy from India, he would do the same thing, dress me up like I lived in India. Read me the story, and I'd act out the little adventure. He would take pictures of me with his camera, do his sketches from that. Um, I remember one day my sister wasn't home, and my father needed a girl model. <laughs> so he dressed me up as a girl. Um, and another thing I learned about being creative is about thinking outside the box. You know, a lot of times, um, there's always a way that things have to be done. But in terms of being creative, you often have to be able to think outside the box. Now, part of that is knowing what the box is. <laughs> then, how do you kind of twist that or put a spin on that or add your own element to it that makes it kind of special? So this is how I start out drawing. Again, I'm not worried about getting everything right in my sketches. This is a rough sketch. It's a little boy climbing into a boat, and I'm just letting my hand circle around the page and find this little boy that's climbing into a boat. And then once I get kind of an idea of what I want, I do a tighter sketch. At this point, I usually use a model, like my dad um, did. And um, then I do the finished illustration. And that's the finished illustration. And this took about 15 hours to do. This is a, another beautiful story uh, called Suki and the Mermaid about a little girl's adventure down by the beach. And it's a folk tale written by Robert Sansusi. And what I loved about this story was I got to use one of my favorite models to model for my mermaid. I wanted someone who I thought was really beautiful to be my mermaid. This was a story about a black mermaid from the Caribbean who eventually had originally come from Africa. So I thought, I know who I use as a model for my mermaid. It's someone who likes to swim. <laughs> It was my fiance at the time, Andrea. <laughs> so that's Andrea there, except she really doesn't have a tail like that. Um, <laughs> although I'm not sure, because when she's in the pool, she really moves fast. <laughs> so this is Alvin Ailey, one of the first books that I did with Andrea. And she'll talk a little bit about this. OK. So this is a picture book biography. And it's so interesting, because you know, with the Common Core, we have such an opportunity, as we know, to make so many creative connections. And that's really what we're always doing in some of the books that we're, Alvin Ailey and some of the books that we're going to talk about moving forward. So, uh, you know, I always wonder if I were going to write a book about anybody in this room, the first person I would ask would be somebody who knows you, which would probably be your mother or, you know, your parents or somebody like that. And Alvin Ailey's mother, Lula Cooper, spent a very long time talking to me about young Alvin, who every Sunday went to the True Vine Baptist Church in Navasota, Texas, and watched, sat in the first row pew and watched his mother Lula sing in the gospel choir, rockin' my soul in the bosom of Abraham, rockin' my soul in the bosom of Abraham, rockin' my soul in the bosom of Abraham, oh, rockin' my soul. And that was the story she told me. And how for young Alvin Ailey, it was like 
uh, pageantry. It was like going to the theater, seeing the women in beautiful dresses, the men in dignified suits. And in creating this book, there was that was the kind of first nugget. And I, I realized there were so many other aspects that I could build around that. The history of uh, uh, gospel music, the history of dance, the history of choreography. And I'll let you talk about some of the visual research. So for the artwork, I had to do a lot of research. I wanted to make sure that I really captured the feeling of what it was like to be Alvin Ailey. So I actually took dance classes. And I learned the Dunham technique. So when I needed a model for Alvin Ailey, I modeled for Alvin Ailey. So um, even though that's Alvin Ailey's face there, that's really my body. <laughs> but you know, you know, Alvin had a real special way of holding himself, very erect and strong. Actually, everyone try that. Put your arms up like this. Now turn your head to your right. There, you could all modify Alvin Ailey too. <laughs> So this is how I do my artwork. It's called scratchboard. It's a special technique I learned while getting my master's degree at the School of Visual Arts. And it's a technique where it's a blackboard. It's actually a whiteboard covered with a thin coating of black ink. Very similar to something I did as a student where we would color a piece of paper with crayons. I don't know if you've done this. And then cover it with black ink and then scratch into it. Well, this is a more sophisticated technique of that where it's a whiteboard covered with a thin coating of black ink with a very sharp tool called a scratchboard nib. I scratch my drawing in. So now I have a simple line drawing now, but I want to add detail to it. I want it to be more three-dimensional. So I'm going to scratch away the areas that are going to be white. But I don't want to just scratch any which way. I want there to be a purpose every time I make a mark. So if I'm scratching the floor, which is really hard and straight, I'm going to use hard and straight lines for that. If I'm scratching his shirt, which is flowing and moving in the center of the page, I'm going to use flowing and moving lines for that. If I'm scratching his face and his hands, that skin that's very soft and delicate, I'm going to use soft and delicate lines. And I get an illustration that looks like this. And then I add the color last by painting right on top with oil paint and oil pastels. And then I wipe away the excess from the black areas. And then when it dries, I can scratch back into it. And that becomes the finished illustration. And what I've developed now, I realize, is my style. Because every artist has to have a style. And mine has become the scratchboard technique until I change it to another style. <laughs> so this is Max Found Two Sticks. This book is special to me for two reasons. One is, it's a story about a boy that plays the drums. And I've played the drums ever since I was in the fifth grade. I played in the school band. I played in marching bands. I played in a little jazz band. In high school, I played in a rock band, which was really great as a high school student, because I loved to just pound away as loud as I could um, until my parents would bang on the door and tell me to shut up, because I was giving them a headache. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to illustrate a book about a boy that plays the drums. But I had one major problem, and that is I didn't have a story. And I actually didn't think I could write. I mean, I knew I could write, but I wasn't like a real writer. You know, in school, I kind of struggled with that. I was more visual. So I thought I would make this book a wordless book. That way, I wouldn't have to write anything. <laughs> so I did all these drawings, these really cool drawings of a boy playing on different drums. And then he finds more drums. And it goes from one drum to two to three to four. And then I found this nice pattern of different family members would introduce different drums before he played them. So there was always a foreshadowing of what he'd be playing on next. And it was all these cool patterns, which reminded me of drumming. It was about patterns. But I realized I was missing something very important about drumming, sound. So I needed sound. And I thought, oh, I, I, I don't think I can do this. So I thought, um, I'll ask Andre to write it for me, because she's a really good author. So I said, honey, how'd you like to write a book about a boy that plays the drums? And she basically said, no. Uh, she wouldn't like to write, and that she couldn't write it because it wasn't her story. So she told me, she encouraged me to write it. She said, I really believe you can do that. And I thought, wow, my wife believes in me. I've got to give it a try. So I got a computer, started typing my story and hitting the spell check, which I love, uh, and editing it. And it took me about two years to write my story. I printed it out, and it was about half a page long. But I remembered publishers like things double spaced, so I double spaced it. <laughs> then it was a page long, and I was a lot happier. So um, I'm going to recite this to you. But before I do, um, I want to show you something. When I was working on this book, I used to love to work really late at night when everybody else in the house would be asleep. Andrew would be asleep. Um, my daughter would be asleep. My son was about three. He'd actually climb out of the crib and run around the house, and I'd have to catch him and put him back in the crib. <laughs> Eventually, he would go to sleep, and the house would be nice and calm and peaceful. And that's when I loved to work, it was late at night. But after I work for about 20 minutes, I often need to take a break. I need to kind of change sets, do something different. And one of my favorite things to do in the middle of the night when I take a break is to um, play the drums. Yes. 
Now, luckily for everyone in my household, I did not have a drum set in my studio. So instead, I'd play in the back of an office chair, which has kind of stuffing in the back. But the problem is I beat on it so much, all the stuffing started coming out. Um, but I want to play just a couple beats that I like to play, just to like loosen me up, just to change my brain chemistry so that I can go back to work. Um, Improvise little just drum beats. Um, by the way, this is a drum from my electronic drum set that I have in my studio now. I have a whole electronic drum set, so nobody can hear it but me. Um, another beat that I want to show you, which I think is really cool to do with children, it's called a paradiddle. And I want everyone to say that word. Paradiddle. Very good. And a paradiddle sounds like the word, how you play it. It play it like this. It's paradiddle, paradiddle. So it's right hand, left hand, right hand two times. Left hand, right hand, left hand two times. Right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. Right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. It's a paradiddle. Thank you. So after I play a few of those, I'm ready to continue. So I'd like to recite my story to you. But before I do, I want us all to experience the joys of playing a paradiddle and you'll see the beneficial results of this. So if you can clear your laps, and I want you guys to play on your laps, but don't start yet. We're all gonna do it at the same time, and I want you to mirror me so everyone can lift your right hand in the air. For you, I'm mirroring you, it's the one on this side, in case you forgot. I know, I do that sometimes, okay. And I want you to say the hand you're using while you do it. I think that'll help. Ready, right hand up. Right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. Right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, right. Okay, this is kind of like brain gym. You have to practice it to get good at it. So um, what you can do is you all get home. You can practice all you want until your significant others tells you to be quiet because you're giving them a headache. So I'm going to recite to you Max Found Two Sticks by me. It was a day when Max didn't feel like talking to anyone. I think I put that in there to get rid of a lot of dialogue. <laughs> so he sat out on the front stoops and watched the clouds gather in the sky. A strong breeze shook the tree in front of Max's house, and he noticed two heavy twigs fall to the ground. Max's grandfather was cleaning the front windows. Hey, Max, what are you doing with those sticks, he asked. But Max didn't answer. He just tapped on his thighs. Pat, pat, patat. Putter, 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 patat, imitating the sound of pigeons startled into flight. When Max's mother came home after buying new hats for the twins, she asked, what are you doing with Grandpa's cleaning bucket? But Max didn't answer her either. He just tapped on the bucket. Tip, tap, tip, tippity tip, tap, playing along with the light rain falling against the front windows. When the clouds moved on and the sun appeared, Cindy, Sean, and Jamal stopped by drinking sodas. Hey, Max. What are you doing with those hat boxes? Max replied by beating on the boxes, dum diddy dum, dum diddy dum, diddy 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 dum dum, playing along with the beat of the tom toms in a marching band. Son, what are you doing with those soda bottles? Max's father asked as he took the garbage out on his way to work. Max replied by tapping on the bottles. Ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, playing along with the music from the church bells around the corner. Soon the twins came out to show off their new hats. Hey, Max, what are you doing with those garbage cans? Max replied by beating on the cans. Cling clang the bang, a cling clang the bang dang, playing along with the thundering wheels under the train that his father worked on as a conductor. Suddenly Max heard thump to de thump thump to de thump as a marching band rounded the corner. Max watched with amazement and copied the rhythm. And as the last drummer passed, he saw Max. And with a slight nod and a wink, he tossed Max his spare set of sticks. Thanks, said Max. And he didn't miss a beat. The end. Okay, 
So this is another picture book biography entitled Duke Ellington. And we talk a lot about giving students background knowledge. So the way that this book began was walking into the Museum of the City of New York and seeing an exhibit about Duke Ellington and going into the little kiosk and listening to music about Duke Ellington and then being inspired to take a tour of Harlem and the history of music in Harlem and then going home and listening to more music about Duke Ellington and then starting to write a book about who we call in the book The Piano Prince and how his musical journey began. With each of our biographies, we like to start with the influences as a child and how that came around to what influenced uh, the adults that we all know and, and love. And as painting my artwork, I'm also looking at artwork, like artwork from the Harlem Renaissance, so that I'm familiarizing myself with Aaron Douglas, Romare Bearden, and finding out how did they solve visual problems, how to, how to illustrate music, for example. So that's my little abstract expressionism on the back there, the swirly colors that symbolize the music. Oh. There's Andrea and our daughter, Chloe. Um, Andrea was modeling for one of the ladies in the book. Uh, that's why she has the jewelry on and the fancy hat. And our daughter, Chloe's in the picture because, well, actually, she wasn't supposed to be in the picture. She was supposed to sit quietly in her high chair, but she kept kind of crying a lot. And, and I think we put her in a little bouncy seat, and we turned it on, because she used to like that. It started vibrating, and she started screaming her head off. So when we picked her up, she stopped crying. So I thought, you know what? Maybe she wants to be a model in her daddy's book. So I added her down there in the corner. Looking at her daddy, that's me, listening to music. I'm also in a lot of my pictures, by the way. <laughs> so here's one of the great things about waking up early and going in the pool. Uh, when you come out of the pool, you believe that anything is possible, even a cat that can talk. So uh, there I was one day, I had the notebook. Thank God I had the notebook uh, with me on that particular day. And all of a sudden, I just kind of made a new friend in the pool. I heard a voice saying, you may think I look like any other cat, but baby, I'm in a class all by myself. Scat Cat's my name, a name I've earned. Got my name from knowing Ella, Ella Fitzgerald, the queen of scat. Now what scat, you ask? Scat's the sound that don't hold back Ella's sound. That was scat. Singing so supreme, music's velvet ribbon dream. Let me tell you Ella's story, because you see, I was there from the get-go. I saw it all, me, Scat Cat Monroe. I watched Ella go from a small town girl to the first lady of song, to a vocal virtuosa bar none. So sit back, listen up, here's four tracks, cut to cut, here's how Ella got her sound, got her silken, silver style, got her lady, Ella Scat. And that is Scat Cat Monroe, the narrator of this book, although it is nonfiction, he is telling us Ella Fitzgerald's story. With each of our picture book biographies, the goal is to give a child the takeaway. Who was Ella Fitzgerald? So that they can tell me after reading the book. If they don't ever read the book, they can just read that frontispiece where we're introduced to the kitty cat who's telling us that she was the queen of scat. If that's all they come away with, great. And as Brian mentioned, the creativity in the poetic aspect is what we hope will be the portal and get them into the book and more information. And this is Ella, at 17, entered a dance contest at the Apollo Theater, was so nervous she couldn't dance. Instead, she decided to sing, and she rolled out a sw tune, Sweet Enough to Bake, as Andre describes it. Again, I'm looking at artwork, again, references from the Harlem Renaissance at the same time that she was singing. Um, Aaron Douglas was a major influence for me. He would use those kind of images, that, those colors that radiated out, that kind of suggested her voice uh, reaching the crowd. Um, a lot of abstract expressionist I was looking at and surrealist artists. For example, this is a scene where, do, um, where Chick Webb and his orchestra are playing jazz and they're playing a specific kind of jazz music. You wanna sing a little bit of it? Sure, well, let me just say that we all know, you know, we're all, we all love to read every day and lead a better life and that's wonderful and I do, I do that thing. But we encounter those students who don't wanna read every day, even though we know it will help them lead a better life. There are students who struggle. And what I often tell those students is, if you don't like to read the words right away, read the pictures. If you have a wonderful illustrator, your illustrator's illustrations will also tell you the story. So based on this picture, if we are reading the picture, what kind of music, what kind of jazz music did Ella Fitzgerald sing? Swing, thank you. Da da, da 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 da. Da da. 
Da 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 da. That's swing music. Da 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 da. -da. That's swing music, like you're on a swing, very regulated. And there's my buddy, Scat Cat Monroe. So eventually, Ella introduced, uh, met another jazz musician, a trumpet player, who taught her another way of making sound, where she would actually sing with her voice the way he would play with his trumpet. He's a famous trumpet player. And um, by looking at my artwork, you actually ought to be able to tell me what his name is. I'm actually going to give you a hint. What happens to you when you spin around? What do you get? Dizzy That's Dizzy Gillespie, yes. And um, do you want to do a little sample of scat singing? Well, yes, and pe students especially often ask, why did Brian Pinckney put that man upside down in the book that is on purpose? Bobbity beep, bobbity bop, bobbity beep, bobbity beep, bobbity beep, bobbity bop, bop beat up, bop beat up, bop beat up, bop beat up. Yes, Dizzy Gillespie told Ella, use your voice like my horn. Improvise, make your voice an instrument, and you can hear the differences between scat and da 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 da. -da. So, thanks to Dizzy Gillespie, Ella was freed up to scat. She was big, she was black, she was so beautiful. Her name was Sojourner. Truth be told, she was meant for great things, meant for speaking, meant for teaching, meant for preaching the truth about freedom. Big, black, beautiful, true, that was Sojourner. Now, that's the way the book begins. There are many books about the wonderful Sojourner Truth. What Brian and I wanted to do with this one was, again, invite readers in by hearing about her massive size, her size 12 feet, her six feet frame. And that was something almost like an athlete, almost like a Michael Jordan. And that was part of her power. And then we invite readers into the historical experience of all the significance of what Sojourner Truth did. Now, as a creative person, I'm always playing with technique. And one of the techniques I've always loved was watercolor, which is a technique that I used in that first Kung Fu picture I showed you, my self-portrait. Um, well, I introduced that again to my illustration. So this illustration is not done in scratch board. It's actually done in uh, Luma dyes, which is a type of transparent watercolor. And again, I wanted to get that real feeling of motion that I like in my artwork. And with this technique, I was able to do that with these flowing colors and lines. Okay, don't. Right. Okay. Uh, so when you wake up in the morning, what is the first thing that is on your mind? What do you think about? You open your eyes, the alarm clock goes off. Shower. Yes, hot water. Hopefully I have it today. Okay, what else? What are you gonna wear? Yes, I have an obsession with that. What am I gonna wear? What am I gonna wear today? What else? You open your eyes, what do you think? Snooze, bring on the, think of me, 4 a.m. snooze. Anybody else? Does anybody think of breakfast? You think of? Drinking water. I think of diving in water. That's what I'm thinking of at that early hour. Well, for me, this morning, woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom. Hallelujah. 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 We must meet hate with love. We must meet hate with love. Those are the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that on February 1st, 1960, inspired four students to walk into a segregated lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina and sit down. They sat straight and proud and waited and wanted a donut and coffee with cream on the side. Those kids didn't budge, they didn't move. Until they were served, they refused. All they wanted was some food, a donut and coffee with cream on the side. So this is from the book Sit-In, about the Greensboro sit-ins of 1960. And one of the ways we like to teach children through our books is through the experiential. This book was originally written as a play I wrote it as a play in my mind, and the idea that I had was, if I'm a teacher, and I have 30 children, and I have to teach them about segregation, 
in an experiential way, so they experienced it. I'm not just giving them the book. How would, how would I do that? And so I wrote it as a play, and I had roles for all 30 children, people who come into the scene, people who can you know, be the hecklers, the, the four students sitting, the policemen, the waitress, other patrons, and uh, those students who are more shy and less inclined to speak. You know, perhaps they can be the ones that are sitting there. And I, you know, was just, I just did it for fun. I just wrote it as a play. Again, if I've got fifth graders and I've got 30 kids and I've got to do something with them, there are kids who can hold you know, placards with civil rights slogans and the slogans of Dr. Martin Luther King. Those kids can paint those slogans and thereby learn the, the, uh, the dialogue of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And then my agent convinced me, just write it as a book. So that's what I did. So this is the book sitting. And the artwork, is, again, is done with um, a special paintbrush that I love. It's called a Da Vinci Maestro, and it is amazing. First of all, I love Leonardo da Vinci. He was like my all-time hero. He was a musician, he was a painter, he was an inventor. And, um, and this brush is actually longer than an average watercolor brush, so it holds a little extra paint, but goes to a very fine point, so I can actually draw with it at the same time. So when I was working on this book, I thought, what would it feel like if I was there, almost like a courtroom artist? And I was illustrating the scene of these four students sitting there, proud. So almost like I'm a fly on the wall. Then I thought, what would it be like if I was the actual lunch counter? Because the lunch counter experienced all of this. Like if the lunch counter had a consciousness, what would that be like? And so that at some point it would be almost like, the, uh, like it was caving in on itself. And um, at other points it would be like a road. Going into the future, as more and more people join the sit-ins and it spread from different cities throughout the South. Do you want to add anything else? Sure. I was gonna talk about the experiential again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I would like to ask you a question. Do not raise your hand, do not call out. Just think quietly in your heart about the answer to this question. And I will say, I ask this of a lot of school children, and I say, don't raise your hand, don't call out. All the hands go up. <laughs> okay, so here's the question. If you left Scholastic today, this afternoon, and you went out onto Broadway and you went into an eating establishment, and you sat down, you're with your friends, you're eating lunch, you're feeling happy, and you look over there, and for any reason at all, there are four people who are not being served. The waitress is ignoring them, the other patrons are ignoring them. For any reason, she is, some reason, she's not tending to them, and nobody else is. What would you do in that situation? Don't raise your hand, don't call. What, what would you do really? Say it's a homeless person, someone who's unkempt. What would you do? Now, when I ask this of students, and I finally give them the chance to raise their hand, they give me wonderful answers. I would talk to the waitress. I would give them my food. I'd buy them stuff. And I'm like, I'm so happy to hear that. I say, Katie, they needed you on February 1st, 1960. But they didn't have you. No one, you can see in places they're, they're being ignored. And then I flip the scenario, and I ask them, what would you do? Same thing, you leave school today, you go into a place, you're eating, you're having fun, you look over, you know, someone's not being served, but let's flip it now. You are the one that is the one sitting there. Your mother has just ironed your beautiful crisp white shirt and you're sitting quietly and all you wanna do is eat something. And now you're the one being ignored. Hot, the patrons are pouring hot coffee on your head, they're putting pepper in your eyes and ketchup on that beautiful white shirt. What would you do in that situation? And the hands don't go up so quickly because they have to really think about that. And kids are very honest. You know, they say, I'd yell, I'd sit there. Some say, I'd think about the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. I'd walk out. And, and I love to just engage them again because we're going back to learning history through the experiential. And that's what we're trying to do with this book sit-in. And this is the final illustration in the book. It's a gatefold. So there are three sections. And in this one illustration, again, I want to um, appeal to those visual learners. I mean, I was a visual learner. I loved looking at pictures in books. So the whole civil rights movement is in this illustration. I have the lunch counter, which is almost like a roller coaster ride, because it must have felt like a roller coaster ride, holding on for dear life as the world was changing for everyone. So I have the four students not being served, the police officer there. Um, eventually more students came and joined them and they would do their homework and sit quietly and hold to the words of Martin Luther King. Eventually the sit-ins moved to bus stations and libraries and eventually more and more people joined so much so that the laws had to be changed and you'll see the four students being served. 
on the final triptych spread. And look at all those people. If that's my cast for my 28 cast members, my, my you know, 30 kids in a classroom, I mean, you've got more there, but everybody gets to play a role and experience, what, experience history in that moment. And the final spread in the book is the recipe for integration, which I don't have a slide for, but do you remember what that yes, is? Yes, yes it is, and that's the final thing. There's a lot of food metaphors in the book. I, before I do the recipe for integration, I just wanna say that research is critical in all of our books. We are creators of nonfiction. Every fact has to be absolutely positively correct. When I originally wrote Sit-In as a book, the refrain was, they sat straight and proud and waited and wanted a burger and Coke with fries on the side. Okay. At the 11th hour, if you've ever seen in the movies where they say, stop the presses, that doesn't happen in real life because it's expensive to stop the presses. The press is in China. You never stop the presses in real life. Okay. <laughs> However, we learned at the 11th hour through we research things down to the fingernail so that every fact is correct. And what we learned was that they did not order a burger and Coke with fries on the side on February 1st, 1960. They ordered a donut a donut and coffee with cream on the side. So my editor and I are like, oh my gosh, what do we do? And we, we had to rejigger it, we had to. And that seems like an easy fix, like you just take out burger and Coke and put in donut and coffee. It's, it's not that easy if you, if you read the narrative. And then my lovely husband had to go in and put donut and coffee on all of the lunch counters and all of that. And, and it's amazing, you know, you think, who remembers what they ordered at Woolworths 50 years ago? 50 years ago, do you remember? But they did, it was documented, so we had to rework it, stop the presses, and make it all correct, which it is. Recipe for integration. Oh yes, the recipe for integration. Okay, <laughs> so there's a lot of food metaphors in the book. Again, because kids understand a recipe on the uh, brownie box, on the cake mix, with the cupcakes, with the macaroni and cheese. So the, I believe that what the students discovered after they sat quietly and adhering to the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, the recipe for integration, start with love, season with hope, mix with faith, extra faith to flavor, mix black people with white people, let unity stand, fold in change, sprinkle with dignity, fold in something, yeah. uh, <laughs> bake, bake until golden, uh, makes enough for all. That's the recipe for integration, and that's what I think that they discovered after they sat quietly. Only chain that a man can stand is that chain called hand in hand. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. This is the story of 10 bold men who built a chain called hand in hand. Each man a link in this mighty strand, working together, believing, achieving, working toward freedom hand in hand. Okay, so this is hand in hand. 10 black men who changed America. Now, many children, including my own, say, Mom, I gotta read a lot of nonfiction for school. And in the case of my son, he has to read a lot about African American heroes, men. So the request came, I get it from many children, could you make one book? <laughs> I don't have to run around. They're all in one book. I said, okay, I'm on it. And, and the request came, and could you please make it fun to read? I don't want yucky spinach anymore. I don't want nonfiction that is yucky spinach. So I thought, okay. We've all heard these stories. Everybody from Benjamin Banneker, Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King Jr., up through history, uh, Thurgood Marshall, Jackie Robinson, and of course our President Barack Obama. How am I going to make these stories different and fun and interesting? No, bye bye yucky spinach, I don't wanna do that. I wanna give them the experiential, the portal, the, the fun reading experience. So I focus a lot on, I begin each narrative with things that at least I didn't know in my research of what these gentlemen were like as a child. I didn't know, for example, that Thurgood Marshall, who argued in 1954 in the Supreme Court case of Brown versus Board of Education, as a third grader, he was a prankster. When he got in trouble by the principal, he was sent to the dungeon of the school, the basement, which the kids called the dungeon, and the principal made him read the Constitution <laughs> and learn it. So there's little eight-year-old Thurgood Marshall. He had to read it and memorize it and come back and talk to the principal about what you just read. And then Thurgood Marshall got so into this Constitution thing 
he started to make himself get in trouble so he could go back into the basement and learn more about the Constitution. <laughs> True story, but these are the things we don't often hear about. So I try to infuse each of those stories, Barack Obama's you know, pet monkeys, uh, Martin Luther King uh, as a child entering uh, an oratory contest with his teacher and, and, and having to ride back you know, from the north to the south and experience being on a train in one state and then phew, making that, uh, that crossover into the south and you know, having kind of in his mind as a child being free at last and then going back to the way it was. So that was what I tried to do with each of the stories and that's hand, hand in hand, 10 black men who changed America. And with the artwork, I did something a little different. And again, I'm always trying to like experiment with different techniques. So what I decided to do was, I knew I wanted to do a portrait of each one of these. Um, and I wanted them to all be somewhat different. And I didn't want them to look like portraits that we had seen before. So I was playing around in my studio, which what I do, played the drums a little bit, and maybe danced a little bit. And I started painting masks from a book about African masks. And what was great about it was the African masks were in black and white, and I could get all these very structural forms of the way a face would look. And then, just for the heck of it, I decided to take a picture of Martin Luther King and be like, which African mask does he look like? And then I would paint his face over the African mask. And then I did it with, with um, Jackie Robinson, with Barack Obama, with um, Frederick Douglass. So you can't really see it, but that's why there's so much of like a psychological resonance happening with the artwork. And um, you can kind of see the different color palettes behind. All the masks were done in color, and all the features of the, our, our great African-American heroes were done with black line with that uh, special brush that I love, the Da Vinci Maestro. It's a great way to keep, teach kids history. Let them do a picture. Let's draw Frederick Douglass. Look at that beard. He's a lion, lion tree of a man, which I talk about in the book. He's like a lion with that big mane of hair and that beard. One of my favorite things to do when I was in school was whenever we had an assignment, we had to do a report on someone, I would always do a portrait of them and do a cover for my book report. And um, it was great because I always got an A <laughs> on um, the art part of it. I won't talk about that. <laughs> OK, so August 28th, 1963. That's my husband's birthday, August 28th. Happy pre-birthday, Brian. OK, so 50 years ago, in a week from now, uh, whatever, eight days from now, uh, we will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. And what I didn't realize was that at the March on Washington and prior to that, Martin Luther King had a very good friend. Her name was Mahalia Jackson. She was a gospel singer. Each of them grew up in the tradition of the black, sh the black church alongside kind of each other having parallel experiences, each using the power of their vocal talents to inspire people. Of course, Martin Luther King with that mighty way of speaking and Mahalia Jackson with that brass and butter contralto voice. And they met up on the, on the journey, on the path to, to civil rights, to freedom, and uh, worked uh, together throughout the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King invited his friend, Mahalia Jackson. He said, there's going to be a march in Washington. I'd like you to come because I need your help to settle down this crowd. 250,000 marchers. This was before Twitter, before email. But the word got out, and there were those you know, throngs of people. Martin Luther King began to give his speech. And his, I guess he was working from a prepared document. And it was Mahalia Jackson that turned to her friend after singing, I've been buked and I've been scorned quieting the crowd. Martin begins to speak from his prepared remarks. It was Mahalia Jackson who said, tell them about your dream, Martin. That's when he veered from the speech and began telling the crowd about his dream in the speech that we know today. I think this is the value of a friend. Can you imagine what if Mahalia Jackson had not been there and said, tell them about your dream, Martin. And that was, again, another little known fact that I didn't realize about these two buddies that ultimately changed history. And for the artwork, I decided to use a lot of elements where Andre talks about this journey and about the map. And there was actually a map that the marchers got that told them how to organize in the different bus areas and where to march around the circle so they would all be very organized. And the map is actually in the book, in the back of one of the illustrations. Another tool Andre talks about is this dove that is kind of this beacon that leads the journey throughout. So the dove appears on every spread of the book. I also used color in this book where Martin always has blue, and Mahalia always has red and oranges. And when they come together, if you know about art and paint, and if you mix blue with red, you get purple. So when they meet on the March on Washington, there's a lot of purple in the artwork. It's also in the book. 
Okay, so this is the last slide we're gonna show you before we uh, have some questions. So this is our family. There's Brian, and there's me, and those are our two children. Now, this is a little bit of an old picture. That's our daughter, Chloe, who is now 17 and will soon be a high school senior. Remember her, the little baby picture? There she is, and now she's 17 and gonna be uh, in high school. And that's our son, Dobbin, who is now 14 and is gonna be a freshman in high school. Now, the kids don't care uh, that I show you this picture. However, my daughter, Chloe, would like me to tell you that she no longer has braces. <laughs> okay, so now I'm a good mother. You now know Chloe Pinkney no longer has braces. What's interesting is the, the boy now does have the braces. Um, he doesn't care what I tell you, but I will, I will tell you because we love to brag about our children. Um, uh, Dobbin is actually a professional dancer. He is uh, a performer with Alvin Ailey. He travels around, he goes to auditions, and it's kind of ironic the way it all came around. Um, and he is uh, a reader who has to work at it, and uh, he learns a lot, again, through the experiential. So he's a performer with Alvin Ailey. What a lot of people don't realize is that authors and illustrators do not meet each other, typically. They don't work together, they don't go to Starbucks and collaborate. Um, they might be Facebook friends these days. So we have a little bit of a unique situation, because I'm sharing the same box of cereal and the same tube of toothpaste with the guy that is illustrating my books. And so, so we had to we come up that? with some guidelines <laughs> so that we could work together and stay happily married. Um, and uh, a few, one of the guidelines is that we always have a meeting when we talk about our work. We actually don't do it while we're brushing teeth. Um, we go to a cafe and we sit down and talk about the work that we're working on. And, and I spread out the illustrations, the sketches, Andre has her manuscripts. And one of the rules is that you can't say something like, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. Because <laughs> you're not supposed to say that at a meeting. Um, and Andre and I also have different guidelines that we both follow. One of the rules that I have is that Andre, being an editor, is, has a, a really impeccable eye for detail. So when I'm working on my artwork, I don't mind if she looks at it because she has a great eye, but she can't say something to me like, Alvin Ailey's foot looks like a football, because that really hurts my feelings. <laughs> she has to say, Alvin Ailey's foot looks unresolved. I can, I can take that in and I can work with that. And um, by the way, that's very good advice. You know, the garage isn't clean. You can say, you know, the garage, honey, looks unresolved. <laughs> you can take that with if you want. And Andre likewise has some guidelines for me. You can share. Right, right. Okay, so the meeting happens every Saturday uh, to the point now where they know us in the diner. They just keep pouring, you know, pouring the water. Um, we sit there for hours, and it usually is from about 10.30 in the morning until about two in the afternoon. So it's long, like we're talking about, we're just working it all out then. And uh, my requirement is Brian has read my manuscripts throughout the week, he's made notes in the margins, and no matter if it's wonderful or terrible, Brian must, also, all, must always begin by saying, honey, you're off to a good start. <laughs> I see what you're trying, and then, and then we can listen. And then when the meeting is over, it's done. There's, you can't come back the next day and say, oh, I forgot, or we, that, that there's a beginning, middle, and end to the meeting, and there's a good reason for that because we do have a family and we collaborate and we work together. We could be talking about work all the time, and that became a pattern, so we had to contain it. Um, and the other thing is that people often ask, well, why, how is that possible that you can't look at what your husband's doing, or why do authors and illustrators stay, uh, stay apart? In my role at Scholastic as an editor, that's part of what I do. If the author wants to talk to the illustrator, they have to talk to me. I will convey the message. And the reason is because the artist should feel free to do what he wants. He should feel, he can think of things I would never think of. He doesn't need me kind of whispering in his ear, I think Ella Fitzgerald's dress should be yellow, you know, whatever. He can make a lunch counter that's like a roller coaster. I would never think of that. Um, Brian's studio is, he's got a workspace in our home, but also outside of our home. I never go there, I don't ask him how it's going, I don't look in the window, you know. Um, he should feel free to do whatever he wants. So, that's how we work together. So we're gonna end, but before we do, you have been a wonderful audience, so I would like you to help me with one more thing, because we've had a lot of fun musical moments today, and uh, I'm going to uh, sing something, and when I give you the hand, I would like you to echo it back to me, okay? You think we can do it? All right. I'm on, my way. I'm on my way to freedom land. To freedom land. I'm, on I'm on my way to freedom land. To freedom land. I'm, on I'm on my way to freedom land. To freedom land. I'm on my way 
to freedom land. Now we're going to do one more. We're going to change it up a bit. I'm on my way, on my way. To, reading to reading land. I'm on my way, on my way. To, reading to reading land. Use it with your students. I'm on my way, on my way. To, reading to reading land. I'm on my way to reading land. Give yourselves a big round of applause. You guys are awesome singers.